We're uh, quite lucky today to have uh, Bob Seek uh, talk to us about launch operations. Um, Bob joined uh, NASA early in his career after a, a spell with the Air Force. This was in the early 60s and he worked on pre-launch checkout and servicing of Gemini and Apollo then went into the shuttle program. He worked on ground operations for the approach and landing tests. Uh, we'll hear more about that testing when Gordon Fullerton uh, comes here um, at the beginning of December. Um, and then he, uh, he worked as a launch director for a lot of the early shuttle missions, uh, including my first flight and then went to be uh, the shuttle operations director at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, but then after the Challenger accident, he came back and worked on another, I don't know, 40 or so launches. So with the exception, I think my last launch was in 96. You had already graduated, right? But, but, uh, but Bob was the launch director of four of uh, the first four of, of my flights. And, and uh, so you know, he's the head of the, the whole team of really thousands of people who are responsible for getting the shuttle ready to fly and for certifying that in fact it is ready to fly and that's a it's a very complicated uh, critical uh, and from a safety point of view absolutely one of the most important things that we do is to figure out when this incredibly complex vehicle is really ready to go so um, uh, Bob's going to talk to us uh, both about some of the aspects, the technical aspects of the launch operations, um, but also I hope that, you know, from a systems engineering point of view, uh, we'll have a chance towards the end to talk about some of the planning that was going on while the shuttle was being designed and some of the compromises which had to be made, which we've, some of which we've already addressed between the uh, efficiency of turning around and maintaining a vehicle like the shuttle vis-a-vis uh, -vis the actual initial upfront cost of it. So um, with that as an introduction, Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeff, and good morning. Uh, as Jeff indicated, I, uh, I got into the business of launching people and payloads into space a long time ago. Uh, I was privileged to be part of all of the human space flight program, so I, I did a lot of that. What I didn't do, I, I saw most of, and, and I have an opinion on all of it. So please ask questions. If I don't have the answer, I'm, uh, I'm sure to have a, an opinion. <laughs> I'm going to spend a little bit of time. We talk about launch operations, but that's the final three to four days of a campaign that begins three to four months before you actually start the countdown clocks and and, uh, and put the astronauts in the vehicle and go fly. So I'm, I'm going to spend some time on the background of preparing the shuttle, the ground systems, the flight systems uh, prior to the launch count process particularly to talk about the the engineering involvement and the responsibilities in those processes but in order to talk about launching I have to talk some about the operations of putting the final pieces together and uh, and doing the test and inspection prior to launch and then when I, I want to get into the real meat of it which is the the human factors the the role of the engineer the role of the managers in the process of of testing inspecting checking the flight systems the ground systems and certifying that it's okay uh, to put the crew in and go fly and that, that's where we're going to spend most of our time but I've got to I got to go through some background first um, I don't know how many of you have been to the Kennedy Space Center any anybody been down to the, okay so you you've you've seen it's it's a city where we launch we've launched everything from since the beginning programs mercury gemini apollo uh, the most prominent fixture is this vehicle assembly building which is was used in the apollo program to put 
together the 300 foot tall Saturn Apollo rocket. Shuttle is about half that size, but we use this building to do the assembly, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's a city. We have our own power systems. We have facilities to check out the orbiters, to process the solid rocket motors. We have administrative homes for the, uh, for the people, and of course we have the, the highly visible launch pads that are uh, out on the, on the ocean. And we also have a runway when the weather is, cooperates and we can bring the shuttles back to Florida. Uh, we can take care of the landing and recovery there. The process. Talk a little bit about the process. When an orbiter returns from its previous mission, uh, it goes through essentially a um, disassembly inspection and then build it back up and test it to make sure that it's still within the certification base uh, that the engineers set up for it that you've already heard from uh, previous to this lecture. It, it's You would like to think that if the orbiter flies and the rest of the elements a successful mission, you could just do it like an airplane, uh, take down the, the down cargo, whatever, get it configured for the next payload that's going to go go up, clean the windshield, so to speak, and the crew cabin, and go fly it again. But the rules don't allow you to do that. The rules that the other engineers that talk to you have set up uh, are such that you have to assume that in some way, even though during the mission everything seemed to work okay, that that hardware was compromised through the process of re-entering, landing, refurbishing those systems that have to be refurbished. You, something may have been invalidated. So you have to test all that stuff that worked just fine in the previous mission, plus all of the, the systems that were not used in the previous mission, particularly the backup system, the things that you would have to rely on in the event that the primary system uh, doesn't cooperate during the next mission. And because of the way the orbiter was built, with its miles of wiring and thousands of components that are active components, uh, you have to disassemble a lot of that stuff in order to meet the requirements that the program is levied on. So after the orbiter lands and, and you get it safe and, and the crew is out and you take out the payload, we spend a minimum of two to three months roughly a quarter million labor hours of touch labor on the orbiter to do this disassembly, test, inspection, refurbishment process. Before we uh, remove it from the hangar, take it to that vehicle assembly building, integrate it with the tank and the solid rocket boosters, and take it on out to the launch pad to go fly again. Um, and that's where the lion's share of the work is. The, the work on the tank, and the payloads, and the solid rocket boosters is all peripheral to the processing of the orbiter. Yes, sir. All that extra testing you do on all the components that we find, do you find a lot of failures when you go through? Do we find very few. Very few. And you could do the trade off of, well, is this effort worth it? But on the other hand, the few that you find, you're glad that you found them because if not, you may not have discovered them until you got out to the launch pad and serviced your hazardous systems or worse yet, you find out when you get in, in the mission. And then the, the impact of that could be not only a safety impact, but it could be a higher consequence than spending the month to two months in the orbiter processing facility doing that work. Yes? But is there a learning curve? I mean, uh, are you, I mean, after each mission, do you, yes. um, which system you have to look at? Specific? We look at it and say, you know, this system is performing just fine, so we don't have to do this intense, invasive inspection and test every flight maybe we can just do it once a calendar year or every two to three missions whatever the designer thinks you know is is the criteria for checking on the health of the system and we've done that over the years and after we've had a couple of years of, of missions where everything is working just fine we start relaxing these requirements and then something like challenger happens 
or something like Columbia happens. And the pendulum of conservatism swings the other direction and we do more tests and more inspections to verify the hardware because people want to be able to say and we want to be able to say well we've done everything possible to make sure that that's a hundred percent functional operating safe orbiter and and so getting getting this process down to where it meets the original advertising brochure which was you know we're going to fly these things every two to three weeks uh, you start in that direction and then events occur either during a mission or you have the really bad incidents like Challenger in Columbia and the conservatism swings the other way and you end up doing more work and in addition to that engineers because because we are what we were are I was one we we have all this hardware available we like to modify it we change it you know we upgrade it because there's new technology available in computers or in composite materials so when the orbiter gets to this processing facility regardless of how well the mission flew the designers with their good intentions say hey you know we want this orbiter to last another five years or ten years so we want you to do this upgrade to the avionics system or we want to change out all of the actuators that hold the payload in the payload bay and this and that so you modify and that adds more time it makes in more complexity to the process which invites more tests and inspections so it's you're constantly in a mode where unfortunately if the mission flies perfectly by the time you get it and you plan your campaign through the processing facility uh, and I'll show wrong way um, you plan your campaign with schedules to last two months maybe roughly a third of the work you do is work that you hadn't planned when you initially brought that orbiter into the orbiter processing facility it's non-standard work it's stuff that you uncover in the process of doing your test or inspection or it's new requirements or new changes that come from the designers that have to be implemented and from an efficiency standpoint if you're in the manufacturing or production business that is not efficient if a third of your work that you laid out for the next two months uh, at the end of that two month period a third of it was stuff that you had not planned on doing which means you don't have the parts ready you don't have the engineering you don't have the instructions yes do you build in time to cope with that now now that you know that you know in contingency time, time yes yeah you build, you we set up our operation and let me go let me go back to that um, we set up our team and our operation to run five days a week, two shifts a day, uh, and leaving the weekends free to catch up for this non-standard stuff. We essentially end up running a six-day work week if we're in a, in a standard template of flying three, three missions a year, which we're not now because we're still recovering from the Columbia accident. But we end up working six days a week and and roughly every three or four days we'll work a continuous round the clock 24-hour operation so we try to maintain that original schedule but we only make it roughly 50 percent of the time due to this again the non-standard work the uh, the extra stuff that works its way in and that's why you know we have a big team you know, that the, our team is made up of the United Space Alliance as a contractor they do the hands-on work they have the technicians they have the engineers that staff the consoles and they're roughly 6,000 population at Kennedy Space Center they take care of the orbiter the tank the boosters um, they're responsible for maintaining all of our equipment that hooks into the shuttle that's required to process it and service it uh, and they have they have ties to the contractors the original equipment manufacturers that built the hardware so technically they can gain access to all the original manufacturer records for the parts that are in the shuttle the NASA responsibility and I need to go 
back one more here. NASA, is, NASA owns the requirements for the shuttle. We, we've delegated all the operational work to the contractors, but it's a national resource. You know, taxpayers paid for it. Government has a responsibility. They, they, they can't divest themselves from that. So NASA owns the requirements. The requirements for saying what you test, what you inspect, um, and what the specifications are for acceptable performance of that. That's controlled by NASA. Uh, the management of the contractor at Kennedy is done by NASA engineers in an organization. There's roughly 500 people out of the 2,000 population at Kennedy Space Center of civil service people. 500 are directly associated with the shuttle. The rest do payload work. Space Station, of course, is a big, uh, big work item now at, at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, and they're responsible for the requirements. If somebody wants to change a requirement, a NASA person has to approve that change. Uh, and we do insight into everything the contractor does. We have uh, at each one of the, um, I'll get there, at each one of the milestones when we leave the processing facility, when we leave the vehicle assembly building, and when we get ready to launch, there's a review conducted by NASA to review the, the work that was done by the contractor during the preceding weeks or months. And NASA approves moving the vehicle on to the next stage of its assembly prior to launch. Um, and the launch director specifically is responsible not only for that those last few days of the campaign, so to speak, leading up to launch, but also ensuring that the, the team, the government contractor team, has all the tools available to them to be successful. You know, is the work being scheduled in an orderly fashion? Uh, is the budget, <laughs> the ever tightening budget, constraining their ability to get their work done? Is there too much schedule pressure to meet a milestone? That's the launch director's job. So the launch director doesn't just come in the last three days of the campaign with the, you know, the tie and the suit and, and orchestrate the countdown. They have a responsibility from the beginning to the end of the campaign. Engineering, I, I've, I've already addressed this, but the NASA engineers manage the requirements, the changes to the requirements. Uh, they're the ones that, in addition to the contractor, this is a check and balance. They look at all of the, the data, the engineering results of the tests and the inspections, and they approve that they met the requirements also. They participate in critical operations. A critical operation is a, is a test on a specific system, uh, servicing of the vehicle for launch count, or any of the non-standard work that comes up during the, the process. They audit what the contractor does, and of course, because the contractor, you know, we're the customer, they're the contractor, we have a lot of criteria to grade them on for their award fee performance. Uh, the operations people manage the scheduling. You know, as I indicated, you know, we, we like to work five days a week, two shifts a day. We really end up working six days a week and sometimes around the clock. So the scheduling activity is dynamic and NASA approves all the schedule. We have to approve all the overtime. You know, we have the authority to say stop or go, not only in launch count, but anywhere in the campaign of processing the hardware as well as the big picture schedule, you know, how many times a year you're going to fly and which orbiter is assigned to which payload and, and those missions. That's still a NASA responsibility. Orbiter processing facility, like I mentioned before, this is, it's like a hangar for an airplane. Uh, a big part of the work effort used to be the tile. Uh, there's, I think you already had a presentation on tile and there's you know 25 to 30,000 of these little bricks glued to the vehicle. Uh, we classically pull damage about a hundred of them on each mission due to ice and things coming off the tank that have to be replaced but we also pull another hundred or so off just to inspect the integrity of the glue that's holding the tile to the structure of the vehicle because a lot of those little bricks have been glued on there for 25 years 
and they've flown 20 to 30 missions. So they're, you know, they're, you, although we have offline test programs that try to duplicate the environment that the tile sees, either from a calendar standpoint or the, the thermal cycles of the mission, uh, you like to go to the real hardware and see what's happening. So we, we do that in, invasive type of work of actually destroying tile, pulling it off the vehicle just to make sure that the aging process is, uh, is not causing any degradation of the system. We pull the engines out um, and do the maintenance on the engines offline because the aft fuselage of the orbiter is a terrible place to work. Uh, so any of the hardware we can get out of there and do it on the bench, it's much better to do, to do that than to try to do it in the vehicle with people crawling all over wire bundles and structure and that sort of thing. The concern about the collateral damage uh, to do the other work in that compartment of the vehicle where the, where the engines are. Of course, you got to take the accommodations from the previous mission out of the payload bay and put in the new stuff for the next mission. Uh, I already mentioned modifications, and yeah, we unfortunately we change more stuff uh, than we probably should. But in order to keep up with the aging of the vehicle and the new technology, that's that goes with the territory of, of flying uh, a system that was designed over 30 years ago. And we prepare it for the next milestone, which is the, the vehicle assembly building operations. This is where we put the big pieces together. Uh, the, the solid rocket boosters are stacked. There's four segments in each booster. That's a very critical process, but only takes, well, takes less than a month. Uh, to do that. The external tank comes in essentially ready to fly from uh, Mississippi, except as you know now because of the Columbia accident, we're still looking at the, at the ramifications of uh, these, these lines and, and other fittings on the tank. The acreage foam on the tank, just to digress a little bit, is sprayed on. And that stuff is tough. Yeah, early in the program we had problems with some of that coming off. Uh, but we solved that years ago. What we haven't solved is where you have to do a manual application of foam over a fitting that is there because that's where the cranes attach to it or because there's a line there that has to be installed at Kennedy Space Center. You can't do it back at the factory. Putting that thermal protection system foam on there, it's a it's a labor-intensive process. It's a critical technique process. And obviously, there's still flaws in the process that the engineers haven't sorted out yet. And that's why that stuff keeps coming off the tank in those places. But we attach the, um, the solid rocket motors are attached to this mobile launch platform with, with four bolts, the diameter of my wrist. This is, this is the, the structural engineers really figured this out good. Uh, so there's four on each one of those that are attached to the launch platform. The tank is attached to the boosters with four attach points. Uh, and those are bolts, again, that are diameter of my wrist. And then the orbiter is hung on the tank in three places with the same size bolts. So you've got six million pounds of, of weight that's attached to the mobile launch platform that's held up by these four bolts, well, eight total, on the uh, solid rocket motors. And, uh, and they've worked out the dynamics of when the engines start because the, the vehicle sways like this because the center of gravity is not right over where those eight bolts are attached. Uh, and that system works fine, but it always amazed me that you could hang that much weight on those few bolts that are only the diameter of, uh, of this, but it works. It works. So the Arbiter is brought over after its campaign. It's hung on the tank, and we um, we test all those connections between the solid rocket booster, the platform, the tank, and the orbiter. And that only takes about a week to do that. And if that looks good, we have a review of all of that work. And if the review says we didn't leave anything undone, uh, that we shouldn't take out the launch pad, then we go out the launch pad. Okay. I ask you, just before you leave the, the, sure. the refurbishment phase, say a little bit about how this differs from just bringing a car in to have a 50,000 mile checkup. That is, 
the, the clean room aspects, the following of procedures, sure. having a checker. Well, a, a, a 50 mile, thousand mile checkup on a car is usually an, an external inspection. You know, you change the oil and the filter and you check all the belts and the radiator hoses and, and you, you change all the fluids. <clears throat> Well, you do that with the orbiter also, but in the case of the orbiter, you, you want to know whether you're this far away from having to do a valve job or the rings and the engine, you know, have now got so many thousand miles on them. So we have the, the equivalent. You take the heads off the engine and you give it a valve job and you take the pistons out of the block and you check for scoring in the block. Uh, you take the transmission out and you pull the gears out and make sure that the synchronizers are still okay. You know, and you go through the rear end and you, and you take all the avionics out or you connect the avionics, you, you take your carry-on test equipment in and you hook it up to these connectors on the airflow meter and the computer in your vehicle and you run all those diagnostics to make sure all that stuff, even though it worked fine after you turned the ignition key off the last time, but that, that all the redundancies and all the capability is still within that hardware and all the margins are still there. And then you button it back up and you make sure you buttoned it back up properly. Well, properly, all of which is pre-established, rid quite rigid flow charts, checklists. Oh yes, yeah. A, che a, a checker checking the checker. A checker, and you have in, you have inspectors that where there's critical things. If you're torquing the connecting rods onto the crankshaft, you know it says that you got to do those bolts at 50 some foot pounds, and the technician will do that, and there'll be an inspector there verifying that. Yeah, he, you know he set the torque wrench at 50 foot pounds, and it really clicked there, and they stamped the procedure that it was done that way. Yeah, I, I, I want to just add to that, I mean, even more emphasis. You don't do anything to the vehicle or to the payload unless you have a written procedure. What, right. what, what is absolutely not allowed is, oh, there's a little problem. Something didn't work the way it was supposed to in the test. Let's just fiddle around. Let's throw a few switches and, and see what, what happened. Well, I mean, that's, yeah. that's normally the way you, you work at things if you're in a laboratory or, or working in your car. Um, but the thing is you, you need absolute traceability because if, if something later on turns up uh, out of spec or, or there's an anomaly during flight, you need to be able to recreate everything that was done to the orbiter. That's why we keep such uh, good records on parts. I mean, if it turns out, well, you can tell that story about the tires you just mentioned. I mean, that they, the, the, people, people keep track of where all the parts of the orbiter came from, the lot numbers, and so if any, if any problem turns up, you can actually then trace on the orbiter and, and see if, if it affects there. It's the, uh, the, all the procedures, you have to, all the work is done per approved work authorization documents. Every step, every touch labor item that's done on the, on the vehicle. And if you deviate from that procedure, which is approved by engineering, you have to get engineering approval to deviate from it. Uh, the, the assembly process, the standard work process of putting the vehicle together after a mission, is, there's over two million verifiable work items for the standard flow. And that doesn't include modifications or the, the, the non-standard work that comes up. You know, the proverbial glitch that occurs when you're checking out your computer system or, the, or when you pressurize the, this fluid system and the leak rate is higher than the specification allows. Well, that engineering comes in and says, okay, here's the trouble pr pursuit procedures. Here's what you're going to pursue, uh, but you don't do any of that until the engineers write the procedure and give it to the technicians or the console operators that said, okay, here's what you're going to do to try to find out the source of this leak. You don't just, as Jeff indicated, just start throwing switches and turning vials and say, well, let's see if we can find out what's going on here. It's all pre-approved. And the reason for that is when you have these reviews that culminate in the final review before you get ready to fly, you want to be able to say that this vehicle is assembled per print, 
that the designers requirements the people you've already heard from that certified that you know this system will work just fine in flight if it looks like this when we launch it you're trying to prove that this is what it looks like when you launch it and it's within the certification base and it's per the, the engineering drawings that we were given and it met all these requirements otherwise you're guessing that it's okay to go fly the machine and you can't do that in this business Sir, so does that whole uh, process of two million standard items all written down, does that yes. seem to create any sort of uh, tension that the engineers have feeling that their hands are tied to go out and do stuff? The, um, well, no, because they're the ones that ultimately say what goes in those two million steps. And if they want to add more yeah. tests or checks or inspections, they... Uh, it's, it's within their purview to propose that. The program, there's a group of senior engineers that are in these what we call control boards that approve the requirements that are implemented at Kennedy Space Center. And they can say, yeah, that's a good idea. Or no, we don't want to change this. Go back and give us more rationale for what you think is a good idea to do to this system. Uh, so in that respect, it's probably f somewhat frustrating for the engineers because they can't do anything different than last time unless they can justify the rationale for it. But that's the way it ought to be. Right. That's okay. Um, the launch pad. It's um, the facilities at the launch pad are. Uh, pretty simple. These are the same launch pads we flew from in Apollo. Uh, we've got storage facilities for the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. We, uh, we try to spend a minimum amount of time at the launch pad because it's pretty, Florida's a nice place to be on spring break, but it's a bad place to have exotic hardware sitting outdoors with all that salt and humidity and the other elements that mother nature throws at you like lightning and you can see on the uh, well I think you can see down here we have a we have a good lightning protection system it's there's a single mast with a with two wires uh, that go out about a half a mile from the launch pad it makes a good Faraday shield uh, and over the years we've been whacked uh, a lot of times with lightning. In fact, it's a good attraction for lightning and we've never gotten enough energy inside of that Faraday shield to, to damage any hardware. However, when we get lightning down there, we tell the workers to stand down and of course seek safe haven. But it, we've instrumented it and, and it, it's taken some big hits, but we haven't gotten anything major inside that uh, would cause us a problem from electric. Yes. After you take the shuttle out to the launch pad, is it very expensive to you know, roll it back and find, when you find a problem and then bring it back up? Yes, it is. And that's why we have these reviews before we commit it to go to the launch pad to make sure that we're not taking any unknowns or any uh, work out to the launch pad that should rightfully be done either in the vehicle assembly building or further back in the orbiter processing facility. So yeah, it's a lengthy process because it takes about a week to hook everything up at the pad and check it before you go into the process of servicing the propellants and doing the hazardous work which has to all be undone if you roll back to the vehicle assembly building. So you got to be you got to make sure you're really ready to go before you you head on out there. Yes. Approximately how many times does that happen? The uh, going back to well it's we probably have done it um, for technical reasons, maybe one time, uh, twenty percent of the time. For weather reasons, like we're worried about, you know, a hurricane or something like that, uh, the same about twenty percent of the time. One out of every five times we've gone to the launch pad, we've had to come back for either a weather problem or a technical problem that either occurred at the launch pad or it's something that happened with a different vehicle in the fleet that may still be in the orbiter processing facility or a component that's similar to one that's on the shuttle that's at the pad that they were doing testing in a laboratory or doing what we call fleet leader testing at one of the NASA facilities and they said you know there's an inherent flaw in this auxiliary power unit and we have to 
change the ones that are in the orbiter uh, because they were manufactured at the same time or they have the same component on it and you can't do that work out at the at the launch pad so you got to roll it back so the hardware at the pad may be just fine you know from the standpoint of that you followed your processes and it checked out great in the previous part of the campaign but an offline issue can cause you to say now nah, we got to roll back and go change out this hardware or fix it or further test it before we can commit it to go fly uh, we have a big water tower out there also which I'll talk about later that's to that's our sound suppression system but basically at the pad with a month is the maximum time you like to spend out there usually now we used to put a lot of payloads in in the orbiter processing facility when we were flying laboratories and that sort of thing space station hardware uh, we install all that out at the launch pad now uh, and we have um, we test all the connections we're you know at a new facility and we have a simulated launch count with the astronauts and this is a tradition that goes back to the mercury program you bring the astronauts down to the cape they go through a, a, a day two days of training emergency egress familiarization with the hardware and then we have a simulated launch count without the propellants and all the hazardous stuff uh, just to remind yeah, if nothing else to remind the launch team that this is more than just a machine you know we're going to fly people in this thing and this occurs roughly two weeks before launch and it's a good it's a good readiness test for the whole team you know it's serious you know we're a couple weeks before flight the crew's in town this vehicle's going to look the best it ever has uh, and we do a simulated launch count down to within a couple seconds of liftoff and then we do a simulated abort uh, with the safing of the vehicle and the crew gets out yeah i'll just add something because that that's always something the crew looks forward to first of all because you you actually get to get in the vehicle which despite the fact that we have pretty good simulators in Houston there's nothing like actually crawling inside the shuttle that, that you're gonna fly in um, and, and there's a lot of safety training that you do down at the Cape which is really kind of fun um, I don't think you, you, you don't have any pictures of the the launch escape Oh, the, the slide wire the pad basket. slide wire. Yeah. They, oh, I don't. You know, in, there's a requirement that that you need to be able to get get off the pad quickly if there's a a launch uh, emergency. And of course, on the real launch day, unlike the simulated countdown where the pad is crawling with people, on launch day there's there's very few people even when you're getting into the vehicle because it's fueled and then everybody else leaves and so they have the, this big slide wire uh, that where if you have to get out of the orbiter in a hurry you you go out and you jump in the bag and you hit a little guillotine and it cuts you loose and you slide all the way down actually in the early days the astronauts kept saying well we need to try this out and and they said no you can't do it because uh, it hasn't been man rated. We said, well, wait a minute. You know, I said, well, it's it's rated for emergency use only, so you can't try it out. But the other thing, and, and then after Challenger, they they insisted that somebody actually ride down in it. And normally, we don't. But the other the other things that you recruit. No, no, no. Just just one person tried it out. Um, but the um, the other things that that you do once you get down to the bottom, there's a, an underground bunker that that you run into, and either you stay there and wait for help or they have these armored personnel carriers yeah. sitting around there with a tank little tanks which which you get in and you've got to be able to drive your tank they have a breakout section of the fence so you drive the tank through the fence out to a helicopter pickup point so we all have to we all, we all have to go out and, and learn how to drive the tank and, and you know we, we we drive over the sand dunes and everything it, and it and and then they also they they have a big pool which they light on fire and and and, and they give you a big fireman's hose and you get you, they show you how to um, make your way through a fire by by squirting a, a water path in front of you and it's so you know all the little things you dream of as a kid it'd be a fireman yeah. drive a tank <laughs> get to so it's it, it's good fun but but it is part of the uh, you know the really the extensive safety procedures that they have and, and all these things periodically they have to exercise so they they do go through every once in a while a disaster drill down at the Cape where they simulate an emergency where they have to pick up the crew uh, either outside the launch pad or even out out in the uh, out 
out in the ocean, and, and you got to you got to keep people at at uh, full operational readiness. So anyway, yeah, that's right. That's it's one of the aspects of tra training. Is we train for the anomalies, the non-standard things. The standard work, we do, they do so much of that anyway. You don't have to train for that. You don't have to train to put a payload in a payload bay. You don't have to train to power up your system and run your system checkout because that's a repetitive thing. But the non-standard stuff, uh, when, when things go wrong, that's where the emphasis of the training is. And it's, like Jeff said, it's a lot of, a lot of fun. It's fun for the launch team, too. We, uh, we have a control center at the Cape, and, and it's called the Launch Control Centers, which, so you would think, well, this is where you launch it from. Well, you do that, but all of the other work that's done in the preceding three months is controlled from the Launch Control Center uh, by test conductors and engineers who wrote the, the procedures and the software that implement all the requirements, and they control the activity on the orbiter or the tank or the boosters when it's still back in the offline facilities or the vehicle assembly building or out the launch pad, they do it from the launch control center. We automate what we can from there, but for the manual activity, and a lot of it is manual because regrettably you can't do all this refurbishment on the shuttle uh, with automated systems. It wasn't built that way. Uh, it is all managed from our launch control center uh, with old computers, uh, but with a great team of people. I'm going backwards here. Yeah. The, um, the, the software we use and the computers, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail like, uh, because it's really, I mean, it is old stuff. But it works. And we, it's, it's like the software programs that the FAA uses to track airplanes. You know, it's it's hacker proof. Uh, there's no external interfaces outside of the launch control center firewall. It uh, it works just fine, uh, and that's where we do the management of our day-to-day -day operations from our launch control room, and we call it the LPS launch processing system software. We've tried to change it a couple of times over the years by new hardware. We have supplemented it with laptops so that we can do more uh, human engineering displays, but the computers are the same ones that we bought back in the late 70s. But then so are the computers that are on the orbiter that fly the machine, so and it works. I, I'm, this is a bit repetitive, but I want to go through it again to, to make sure, that, to emphasize what the role of the engineering is. The designers that you've heard from, they certified their design. And they did extensive testing. Uh, they Just like Detroit does on a car, you know, on the door latch, you know. And they have tested that door latch and said, well, this thing ought to be good for 250,000 miles or 20 years or so many gazillion, you know, opening and closings of the door before it wears out and you got to replace it. Well, they did all that. And to make sure that that hardware is still within the certification base, they develop requirements, send them down to the Cape. We put them in procedures, either manual procedures or software, to implement those requirements. And the team, the United Space Alliance, the contractor, and the NASA engineers will certify at each of the milestone reviews and the process of moving the hardware out to the pad. They've met those requirements. And they did that either by participating in the activity or by in reviewing the test data. Uh, and and that allows us to sign a certificate of flight readiness a few days before launch that all the requirements have been met. When we get into launch count, we've taken a subset of those requirements that, you know, when this, everything is powered up and ready to go fly, all of these systems that are active ought to look like this. You know, the voltages should be between, you know, this upper limit and this lower limit. The pressure should be between here and here. These indicators should show that they're open, and these ind indicators should say that this latch is closed or the valve is closed or whatever. And we put that in what's called launch commit criteria. And that's the acceptable limits for the performance of that hardware when you're at that point, which is nine minutes before launch, when everybody commits that they're ready to go fly. And 
and all those requirements again are implemented by uh, procedures and software and the three days of launch count have roughly well, yeah, these are numbers, but about 500 requirements. There's thousands of measurements associated with those requirements, and most of the, the looking at those measurements is done by computers, obviously. But you have the engineer involved because if it's not within limits, you turn to the engineer for, you know, what's wrong? You know, is there any chance to go fix this, or do we have to change hardware, do we have to do troubleshooting? Uh, so it's not a hands-off operation, obviously. The structure of the launch team, the, uh, the launch director is shows in the middle, but that doesn't mean that he or she is uh, you know, the only one with a go or a no-go button. Uh, the engineers, the people that implement the requirements, you know, there's, a, there's roughly 150 of them in our control center, and they're the ones that provide the go, no-go for all the subsystems, uh, both flight and ground everything's operating within the limits. They report that to a team of test conductors, NASA and contractor, and that's reported to the launch director. You also have, there, we're not alone obviously, we have a, uh, an engineering support area which are all the hidden senior engineers that you don't see on television and there's a room full of about 150 to 200 of those and they're looking at the performance of these systems as they're activated in launch count and they've got all the trend data uh, the previous history of it and they're looking at things like well all right everything's in limits but is it within family you know the last time the system performed it you know the voltage was this or the pressure was this well it's still in limits but it's not the same as it was before so we go look at it go look at more than well that's that's for this group of engineers over here these guys and gals are running through their procedures and if everything was in within limits they just we just turn the next page and go on to the next one uh, and they also have the emergency procedures if something bad happens these are the people that will implement the emergency procedures. But this offline support, they're out there, they're, they're the senior people, they've been there before, they've been out there who knows how many years, and they're asking questions like, well, uh, that didn't look right, you know, or, you know, we missed that step, go back and check it again. That's what they're for. The mission management team over here, these are the people that, that, that that do the certificate of flight readiness. These are the folks that stand up in the readiness review and say, I gave the CAPE folks a good set of requirements. There's nothing that happened with the hardware that they're responsible for in all those offline facilities or on previous missions that should have any cloud over this mission. Uh, they're responsible for certifying that and they do that through a structure of the mission management team. Uh, You've got, of course, the flight director has flight rules and the flight team that they look at during the launch count process, and you're, you're going to hear more about that from, uh, from uh, Wayne Hale. Good. Um, and they obviously have a, a go, no go input to the launch director and the decision process also. The, uh, we have an integration activity that looks the system engineers are each responsible for you know they have boundary conditions on what they're responsible for it's these pieces of hardware it's this wiring it's these actuators or latches or whatever but a lot of that stuff fits together integration technical term for making sure that this person talks to this person and they're hooked in with this one that activity uh, is done by a console in the control room again with senior engineers who actually manage all the automated software that that runs the last couple hours of launch count that really launches the vehicle and they're tied in with that you also have the the more subjective stuff you know you, we launch uh, on a public range public safety is is obviously an issue so the range has to make sure that it's it's safe to fly from a public standpoint there's no boats in the launch danger area no airplanes and that the weather meets the criteria of being able to track the vehicle should it go off course 
and of course the payload has to certify that uh, you know, if there, particularly if there's an active payload that all of their launch commit criteria is met and and last but certainly not least you, you know you have safety oversight of all of that activity and what I don't show on there of course is is the flight crew but they're obviously in communication with all of these people so it, it, that's the network uh, but everybody out here has a no-go authority you know anybody can come on the net or press their switch and say hey, I got a problem we're not going anywhere and and it's the launch director and the launch team's responsibilities to make sure that problem is addressed hold at the convenient graceful to stop all the activity hold point until the issue is resolved the real job and I'll get into this later the launch director is to say no when everybody else wants to go because there as you get further in the launch count the the, uh, the launch fever process sets in it's a natural <laughs> got it it's a natural thing it seems to be people want to go I want to ask you about that a little bit and I'll get into it later on flight rules and the launch and the launch decision there are flight rules that say you can't you must scrub if these conditions are not right and yet there is a tendency to have to, to allow judgment to come in if a let's take an example of a limit on crosswind at the, at the landing for the return to right. return to launch site you see it go above above limits if you look at the rules strictly it says no you can't go talk about that the, the um uh, that's what we use the the mission management team for if there's and you bring up the weather example most of the stuff is pretty straightforward you know it's e either the voltage pressure temperature is in limits or out of limits um, person can question that say I don't like the trend and you've got to stop and clear the air if they say I want more discussion on this I want more data review and that sort of thing that's when we revert to the if, if it's a discussion like that between that, that involves activity outside of the control room beyond the, the purview of the console operators that are running through the procedure we, we rely on the mission management team to manage that activity so the console operators can concentrate on their launch commit criteria and their procedures and their, their software so something like crosswind limits if there's a debate with the flight director and the weather people, uh, we hold the clock and say, mission management team, that's yours. You know, you manage it and and whatever you have to do to resolve the decision, you know, we'll scrub if need be, we'll hold if need be, or if, if the community can get comfortable that these crosswinds that are peaking occasionally out of spec, that's okay to go fly anyway, then we'll wait to hear from the flight director that that's okay. But we we don't insulate the control room from that but we don't want to burden the control center with work and what is an offline issue and it's up to the mission management team to disposition that and you bring up weather because weather is one of the few things that there's really a lot of judgment still involved in you know is the weather good enough to go fly and it's and it's probably the only thing that's in that category because everybody has an opinion on the weather and Florida weather's dynamic and there's usually unless it's winter time there's clouds and and there's always a tendency if you've held for weather or the weather's marginal to hold longer to see if you know the weather gets better and the real issue for the launch director is to try to convince people if the weather's good enough then this is good enough and yeah you could wait longer for it to get better but it's good enough we're running out of window time you know all the time we sit here on the ground with all these systems you know humming along the probability of some glitch or something coming up to scrub you is increased so and just I mean as a personal note when I was in the Air Force I was a weather forecaster for missile operations and and I felt that that was a waste of an engineer's time because you know I was a graduate engineer with my diploma sticking out of my pocket you know I wanted to go launch missiles and rockets and the Air Force said no you're gonna Lieutenant Seek is gonna be a weather forecaster supporting missile and operations so I endured that for a couple of years and put all of that uh, experience in my hip pocket 
and I didn't need it until I got in this launch director job and I spent many hours talking to the weather people who provide the forecast for the launch uh, going over all of the, the data you know and and the technical aspects of the weather situation to, to see if you know if there was if it was prudent to sit here any longer and wait for the weather to improve or whether it's better to to uh, scrub get these guys out of their uncomfortable suits and send them back to crew quarters and recycle for the next day and I didn't so think don't, don't necessarily they won't necessarily scrub but you have to disposition their concern and you will hold until their concern is taken care of yes yes this, this is unrelated to me you talk about but um, you know how the Russians have uh, in going out to the launch pad they use um, they use um, the rail track and they, they, they have the rocket flat can you do that with the shuttle instead of stacking it like this and then pulling it out would it, would it be better easier that the um, <clears throat> well the, the problem the problem with that is the is the solid rocket boosters. You know they weigh approximately when they're assembled uh, a little less than three million pounds a piece, and the joints that cause the Challenger accident are you know they're critical. And I don't know if they went through the the, the technical aspects of the the design, but these things are 14 feet in diameter. You know each segment weighs. 300,000 pounds and they have these two clevises that come together with o-rings in there and and what caused the challenger accident was there was rotation in these joints to the point where the o-rings because of cold weather weren't making a good seal and it caused a gas path and it hit you know 1200 degree temperature uh, exhaust plume just cut through the metal once it it found a path so you want to maintain the integrity of these joints so if you stacked them horizontally and that could be done and then you lift this thing vertically the joints aren't certified to maintain their integrity doing that plus you'd need some kind of huge crane to you know pull this you know three million pounds from horizontal to vertical I, I so it's, it's yeah I mean it's something that could have been done had it been built into the design at the beginning and the Russians have a tradition of doing this yeah. and so that's the way they design their rockets you know for whatever reason that's we never started that way no. from the very beginning our rockets got stacked vertically and that's the way all of the American rockets have been designed uh, for the launch director, I mean, is the launch director ultimately accountable for saying flight worthy the shuttle? The, the launch director is, whether it's flight worthy, actually, that mission management team is responsible for the flight worthiness because they encompass not only the, you know, watching what you did in launch count, but the certification of all this hardware before it even got to the launch pad. And, and ultimately, the launch director is responsible for conducting an orderly launch and making sure that that this mission management team doesn't have any issues, that that engineering team doesn't have any, that this, the console operators have really completed their procedures. That's that's their responsibility. And if there's any fuzz on that, so to speak, even though console operators say they're go and mission management team says they're go and flight says they're go, if there's any concern about that, it's the launch director's job to say no. We're not going to go fly today. You know, I'm going to give you another day or two days to do more homework, look at more data, uh, have more discussions. We're going to scrub today, even though everybody may say we're go. And that's happened before, you know. And 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 I always wondered after, and not too many times when. I've said no when everybody wants to go, whether I get the phone call and saying, well, I'm glad you made us safe today, Seek, but you don't have this job tomorrow. You know, well, I never got that call. <laughs> never did. Uh, the process, not to bore you with, but it, since it's an operation, normally we, we try to launch on, in the middle of a week, Wednesday or Thursday, so we usually take the weekend off before that to clean up everything, give the launch team a rest. So we power up everything, and that's the way we start the process. And that's a couple of shifts worth of work uh, to bring up the ground systems, the flight systems, make sure that all the avionics hardware really comes to life. Uh, and we put in a no work hold at the end of that to take care of any problems. 
if that all goes well, then we get into the more critical activity uh, that has time constraints associated with it. We load the fuel cell, that's the power plants in the orbiter, reactants, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, because they have limited life. Even if you don't have the fuel cells activated, that stuff boils off and you lose it, and that could count against your mission capability. And that's a hazardous operation also. Uh, and then we put in another no work hold at the end of that. Uh, and then we have a, a period of time where we do the final, bring up the final systems, put in the time critical storage, particularly when we're flying laboratories and you, you put in you know, plants or critters or whatever it may be in the, uh, either in the crew module or the payload bay. And the last 12 hours down here is when, you know, is when you really got to make sure, this is a real decision point right here. Are we going to load the external tank, put a cycle on the tank, you know, which, and, and we know that, you know, putting liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, there's roughly half a million gallons in the tank, uh, has its, you know, put stresses into the hardware. Uh, you really don't want to do that unless you're pretty sure you're going to launch that day or that night. So yeah, we have a, a meeting before that to make sure the weather looks pretty good, that, that the mission management team is not working any offline issues. Uh, and that's happened before, you know, a war story for you. The, uh, uh, in you know, the early 80s in one of our missions, we were we assembled the, the mission management team to decide whether or not we ought to go load the external tank and go fly. Everything looked pretty good. And the orbiter project manager said, well, I need to make you aware of this. I just got a, a fax, a telegram from the manufacturers of the, the tires. And the mac manufacturer said they were inspecting a lot of the, a lot of the tires of which we have two of them from the same lot on the orbiter. And they found some blems on these tires. And they don't know whether it's a manufacturing flaw or an aging defect. And we don't know whether it infect, affects the integrity of the tires. But since we knew you were launching tomorrow, we thought we would share this with you. You know, warm regards. B.F. Goodrich, or I think who it was at the time. Well, and so, you know, the mission management team threw that on the table and said, hey, we got to go work this. You know, these people, we don't know. They haven't said they're not certifying the tires. They just said they got a problem. So we say, well, that's fine. Mission management team, you know, you go work that. And let's talk about whether or not it's prudent under these circumstances to co-load the tank uh, with some probability that we get all the way down to T minus nine minutes and you folks are going to say, hey, we need to look at more test data on these tires or have more discussions with BF Goodrich or whether let's not go fly today. We well, don't want to load the tank and go through all that if that's what you think the situation is going to be, you know eight hours away from that and you've put all that you've put a cycle on the tank you've used up a lot of cryos that you can't save because of the heat leak plus your launch team has put a, <laughs> a cycle on depending on the time of day you know they've been up all day all night or whatever so that's the kind of issues that you need to make sure get worked and the mission management team has to handle that but the launch director has to decide nah you know you just go work that for another day or two we're not going to load the tank or what's your, you know, what's the promise of this coming to fruition, you know, the possibility so that it, it makes sense to go try to fly. So what did you do with the tires? We, uh, they, they had, in that case, we went ahead and uh, we tanked. They, uh, the subsystem manager for that, which you may have already heard from, went back to a lot of the test data that they had run on the tires uh, that they had, and had been fairly recent. Langley, I think, was involved in it, and they said, you know, we don't have to worry about those blims being a problem for the tires that are in the orbiter, which, by the way, you don't have any access to at the launch pad. If we were going to change the tires, you'd have to roll back to the orbiter processing facility, and, you know, that would be a couple of months worth of impact to that flight. So, so we ended up not doing anything with the tires. But it, but it, it had the mission management team really busy for about <laughs> eight hours. So, and this this process takes about three days, and it's and we have refined those procedures as you might expect over the years to 
to make this as an efficient and repetitive a process as we can. In addition to minimizing the hard, you know, the, the, the hazards to the to the people and the uh, the uh, the equipment. At the end of the tanking, before, I'm sorry. Before we go to terminal count, usually yeah. we take your, like a two minute break after Yeah, this is a good time to do that. To oh yeah. Yes. No, that's the that's same thing. Okay. Um, thermal count phase. Well, we call it thermal count. After the tank is loaded, half a million gallons of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and, it's, and there's no leaks, and we have leak detectors all over the vehicle, uh, and we've scrubbed a lot of launches because of leaks. Um, the, uh, we give the crew a go to come on out. And if, you know, a crew of seven or eight people, it takes <clears throat> an hour and a half to get them all in, get them connected, check their communications and that sort of thing. So roughly three hours before launch, we bring them out, we get them all connected, we close the hatch and we verify the integrity of the crew module. And that's, we're about, we're at clockwise, we're down to T minus 20 minutes. But if it's a rendezvous window, and most of them are now, the launch window is only five to ten minutes long so you know you gotta we have to be in phase with the same plane that the space station is in and we've got to get in phase with being able to catch the space station or have it catch us so you know the, the launch window is we don't have enough energy in the shuttle to steer to any orbit we'd like to so the launch window is only about ten minutes long so we put in a long hold at T minus nine minutes um, for those kind of missions. It's the equivalent of the two minute timeout in a professional football game. You know, everybody has a chance to, to review their information, to discuss their strategies. Uh, if it's a long launch window, if it was just a lab mission, then we only wait for 10 minutes at this T minus nine mark. But if it's a short window, we set up the clock such that we, we hold there for almost an hour. And then we do, as you saw on that previous chart, you know, we do a poll of all those people, make sure that they're still go and they're not working any problems or issues. And then we we start this automated <coughs> software program that looks at, in addition to the systems engineers and their consoles looking at all their information, we have an automated program called the Ground Launch Sequencer that looks at all the measurements, all the parameters to make sure that they're within limits. And it issues all the commands to the vehicle and the ground support equipment. And we did that so we could manage the, the repeatability of that process. And yeah, to take the human factor button pressing out of the uh, out of the process as much as possible uh, and and it's and there's not a lot of work that goes on in there and there's very little manual work at five minutes the, the orbiter access arm their ability to get out of the vehicle in a big hurry is retracted it takes two to three minutes to pull that back but we can get it back up to the vehicle in less than 30 seconds which is it's about the amount of time it takes them to unstrap and get out of there anyway if we or if there's a fire or something bad like that that they have to do an emergency egress they start the propulsion units on the uh, the orbiter that pressurize the hydraulic system just like in an airplane uh, there's an automated test of all the aero surfaces like they do on the end of a runway but this is done by the computer and it wiggles the elevons and the, and the rudder and the main engines to make sure all of that that works and we also start the the conditioning of the propellant at this the engine interface and if they already had the discussion about the main engines you have to make sure that the quality of the fluid and the external tank and the quality of it that's right there at the injector of the engine is 
within the temperature and density parameters that the engine was certified at because we have to drain the propellant out of the fill lines and once we've started doing that that propellant starts heating up right there on those valves that are going to go into the injector and start the main engines on the orbiter so that limits our ability to stop and hold after that we're good for four to five minutes after that starts and that process starts at T minus five minutes uh, after that point in time we're either going to launch or scrub in the next 10 minutes um, and then we pressurize the oxygen tank and we pressurize the hydrogen tank but anywhere in this period of time we can stop if an engineer or the automated sequencer says eh, you know something's out of limits we'll stop at those milestones and disposition that problem if we can but for our rules we won't waive any requirements at that point even though an engineer may have a perfectly good explanation as to why this temperature pressure or whatever or limit is not being met if the launch commit criteria the launch rules say no it has to be like this then we're not going to go launch that day we won't after 31 seconds the uh, the solid rocket boosters come to life the, the propellant doesn't ignite but their hydraulic system is powered up their avionic system they're powered up there they their engine nozzles are checked again in an automatic sequence and at 10 seconds if everything looks good and all these measurements that, that our ground launch sequencer has been looking at we send up the computer data bus a go to the onboard computers that said all of our stuff has been satisfied now we're still looking at a few things we're looking at those those bolts that are holding the, the solid rocket motors to the launch pad and the ability to blow the nuts that are holding them uh, should that system fail we would send a cutoff to the onboard computers regardless of where the engines were in their startup system sequence the three main engines everything will stop and and hopefully it'll gracefully come to a stop and and we'll safe all the systems and go from there but that's the final handshake but that's pre-planned between flight and ground is at 10 seconds when we send a command up to the computer say we're all go we can still shut you off and we can shut you off manually too if a console operator sees something happening that they think could be you know compromise the safety of the launch they can call for a cutoff and we have a switch that says cut off it sends a command to the onboard computers and and it'll stop everything within 10 to 20 milliseconds uh, but you don't like to put humans in you know, in a position to have to make that call and that's why all of the critical stuff is done by the computers uh, and I mentioned this the ground launch sequencer that's the console uh, and operators in the back of the control room and they're the ones by the way to determine nobody presses a button for launch a woman in the back of the control room types the liftoff time into the computer when when the launch director tells her hey look looks like we're going to come out of our t minus nine minute hold at this point in time so here's the liftoff time put that in the computer and after that it's a hands-off operation <coughs> How uh, are these commands being physically sent? I mean, a hard line cable. It's a hard line. That's what we call a launch data bus. It's a it's a it's a cable that's connected from the computers in the control room through the liftoff umbilical into the into the orbiter computers. It's a data train, and it's a. And when is that connection broken? At liftoff. At liftoff, the uh, onboard computers if will check the health of the main engines and if the three main engines are within all of their operating parameters the turbines and the pumps and the temperatures then it sends a command to those um, eight bolts that hold the, the solid rocket boosters to the mobile launch platform and the, and the bolts that hold the, the external tank vent arm to the tank and the two orbiter umbilicals uh, it says fire the nuts we're going to go and and 
that's orchestrated by the onboard computers. And when that happens, you know, you're flying. Yeah, you're going. The, the command to ignite the igniters on the solid rocket motors is, is sent at that time also by the onboard computers within a couple of milliseconds. Uh, so all that happens at once. And it's an onboard automated thing. Um, I talked about the, uh, the the human factor. The repeatability is is important, and and we, you know, I mentioned, you know, I gave the engineers a, you know, I th always threw rocks at them, to them because they always want to change things. It's the launch director's responsibility to to manage. They're the owner, so to speak, of the launch count procedures. The 5,000 pages of documentation and the 500 or so software programs that are executed in the launch count process. And we discourage changes to that for obvious reasons. Unless there's a modification to the flight hardware, the ground hardware, or we found something in our previous launch attempt that said, you know, that we either we need to fix this or there's an opportunity to increase the margins. We don't change it. We uh, uh, we try to maintain that the procedure and the hardware the way it's always been, and it essentially is. We do training, obviously, but we train for the non-standard work. You know, we're just like in the, the flight team. You know, they, we have a simulation supervisor that throws diabolical failures out there, and we have a computer programs, and we bring the control <coughs> the into the control center. We bring the launch team, power up the console and their displays look like you know the shuttles at the pad and it's getting ready to launch and, and we throw failures at them <clears throat> to test their their reaction and and to find bugs in our safing procedures and we've done that over the years uh, I think in the um, the next generation of vehicles will probably have more automation uh, and that and that'll probably be a better thing but you'll never take the console operator out of the control center either the launch control center or the flight control center you need you need the person there to disposition the, uh, the problems but uh, it's predictability is is what we're always after you know and, and stable procedures be their flight or ground give predictable results and that's why we automate and we uh, and we control change too. Uh, responsibility. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Losing it. I, t I talked about the engineers. Didn't mention. I don't think technicians and inspectors. But uh, when a technician stamps a procedure that I torqued that bolt, and the inspector stamps that same procedure and says, I saw him torque that bolt. That's their warranty that that event really happened. Uh, that's And that paper trail and that warranty is very important. When, a, when an engineer signs a procedure that tested the flight control system and said, I reviewed all the data, didn't see any glitches, everything met specifications, that signature is his or her warranty that the procedure ran correctly and that they understood the requirements that were implemented by that procedure and the requirements were met and that's that's important you know our whole concept of launch readiness is based on people being responsible uh, for their system be it the designer that signs it that says there's nothing going on offline there's <laughs> there's no faxes out there that says there's a cloud over the tires you know or my last test of the main engines at Stennis uh, there was nothing there that says these three engines that are on this orbiter shouldn't work just fine uh, and they do that in the flight readiness process that's their warranty and responsibility and and, and we hammer this home <clears throat> and it probably comes from I had this quote in my uh, my office for years, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bore you with it, uh, and maybe some of you can guess where this came from. Responsibility is a unique concept. It can only reside in in here in a single individual. You may share it with others, but your portion is not diminished. You may delegate it, but it is still with you. 
you may disclaim it, but you cannot divest yourself of it. Even if you do not recognize it or admit its presence, you cannot escape it. If responsibility is rightfully yours, no evasion or ignorance or passing the blame can shift the burden to someone else. And that's, this is what we push home. And by the way, this quote, anybody? It, it was Admiral Rickover who was testifying before Congress after the first nuclear submarine accident. And he was saying, I'm responsible. It's my program, it's my submarine, I'm responsible. Even though somebody else was commanding it, it doesn't matter. I'm responsible. And we, and we impress that on the managers, the engineers, the technicians, the inspectors, you know. You're important and the work you do is important and when you sign or stamp that procedure or give a go on the net, that's your warranty that everything is, is working and you understand the requirements. Uh, very important, very important in the business uh, that we're in. Decision making, and on the chart that um, this is, this structure has been in place since the Mercury program. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing new here. Um, it's, and and the only issue comes in when there's a gray area. Uh, who makes the call? and how much judgment is involved in the call. The, uh, and I, 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 mean, I gave you the example of weather. You know, weather can be, everybody has an opinion on it. It can be judgmental. Well, the weather decision is, if it's launch weather related, it's the launch director's responsibility to determine if it's good enough. If the flight director has an issue with the return to launch site winds, and that ultimately is his or her decision. Uh, these people may get involved in it, and they may have offline discussions with the flight director, but it's still ultimately his decision. That's, and, and that's the way it has to be, because they're responsible. This mission management team is not responsible for the, you know, the go no go decision on weather on launch day. It's the flight director for the flight stuff. It's the launch director for the launch related stuff, and it's set up that way. So there's no fuzz on. It. Other people can have an opinion. Other people can have input. Uh, but unless this person up here says launch director, we're no go. Uh, it's the launch director's decision in that case. Um, communication. The um, real important. The and, and I'll give you an example of that. The um, Apollo 13. Some of you, most of you probably don't remember Apollo 13, but Apollo 13 was it was like Challenger and the Columbia, except we didn't lose the flight crew. But it was just as disastrous an event, and by all rights, that the crew shouldn't have made it safely back to Earth. But thanks to the heroics of the flight crew and the flight team and the timing of when that event occurred, uh, they were able to get back home. But that was all caused by activity that was done on the ground uh, well before the launch. And specifically, since I was involved in that, I remember this like it was yesterday. Of course, part of that is an old age thing. Stuff that happened 40 years ago comes in loud and clear. Stuff that happened four days ago, I have a hard time remembering. But <laughs> this is... But, but we had a tank in the in the spacecraft that we ran our, our simulated launch count and back then we put propellants in the vehicle, all the hazardous stuff and detanked and we couldn't detank the liquid oxygen out of this tank that fed the, the fuel cells on the 
on the spacecraft. And just a little more history, the tank had been dropped when it was installed back in California, but engineers and managers had did, did some tests and some rationale on saying, well, it's still okay to install it. So we got it down to Cape, we put the liquid oxygen in it and all the rest of the system. We couldn't get it out of this tank. And after reviewing it, they found, well, there's the standpipe in there that you use to drain it on the ground is probably bent or damaged, and that's why we can't get it out. So the managers and engineers got together for a few days and said, well, turn the heaters on in the tank and vent the liquid oxygen off, heat it up, and it'll boil off as oxygen gas through another loop that takes it through the fuel cells and out of vent on the vehicle and use the heaters to go do that. So they developed a procedure and we went on station uh, that a night, a, a week after we had the anomaly and turned everything on and turned on the heaters and it's fine, you know, the, the, you can see it's turning, the liquid's turning to gas and it's coming out and the console operator in our control room says, hey, seek. I can't monitor the temperature in this tank anymore. Well, why is that? The temperature, well, the, the range on the temperature is from ambient down to minus 300 degrees because it's measuring liquid oxygen. And it's upper limits. You know, it started heating up, and now I can't tell you whether it's, you know, 50 degrees or 350 degrees. Yeah. I said, okay, stop. So we stopped the test. Got all these managers involved, including the people that built the tank and said, hey, you know, we can't, we've lost visibility. We're putting energy into this tank that has liquid oxygen in it. Uh, we can't monitor the temperature anymore. Pressure seems to be fine. Uh, they said, don't worry about it. There's a thermostat in there that's heat sensitive. And it'll open up the power to the heaters if it gets to some limit in there. Just keep your eye on the pressure. Make sure the pressure doesn't get too high. Well, of course, the pressure isn't going to get too high because the vent is open. But so we said, fine. So we turned this ground power supplies on and, and let the thing cook for 10 to 12 hours. And what we didn't know was that that thermostat wasn't certified to the voltage we were using from our ground power supplies. Because we didn't tell them, although our requirements allowed it, that we cranked the power supplies up to 50 volts. And why did we do that? Well, the more energy you put into the tank, the higher the, the uh, heaters get and the quicker the liquid oxygen boils off. You know, high school physics. So, but we didn't tell them that. And the people that built the tank and built that thermostat had only certified it to the voltage the fuel cell supply, which is half that value. So the thermostat welded together, the points did, and we had continuous power going on in there for eight to 10 hours. It got to eight, 900 degrees in the tank. We burned all the insulation off the wires to the fans and the heaters. And from that point on, uh, we're just waiting for something to happen to make those wires come together. And if you then turn power on, you're going to get a spark in an oxygen tank. Not a good thing. Well, that's what happened a day into the mission uh, when they were heading to the moon. And they turned the heaters and the fans on to stir the cryogenics because they were worried about stratification and zero gravity. And they got the spark and it blew, you know, it blew up the service module. Point is, the communication, we wrote down in our procedures what we did. But we didn't communicate that on a real-time basis. And although we reviewed the procedures afterward, as the rest of the team did, the designer who was 1,500 miles away, who had approved what we did over an intercom system, didn't review our paperwork, said, hey, you, you hit that thing with 50 volts, it's only certified with, for 25 volts, even though our requirements allowed us to use 50 volts. So it's a case where requirements didn't you know, preclude us from launching hardware then in hindsight was flawed. But on the other hand, communication, you know, we didn't tell them in real time. And, and as a result, Apollo 13 happened. Uh, so I learned that lesson early on. You're gonna, I mean, even if you're boring them with what appears to be minutia, <laughs> you're going to tell them everything and document everything. And, and, and thankfully, I mean, they, they went through our procedures and they said, well, there it is. You know, and we got, I thought we'd get fired, and actually we got patted on the back for documenting what we had done. Uh, 
so it made it easier to zero in on the root cause of the problem. And as a result, we fixed that and we were able to fly again in, in a few months, uh, as opposed to having to go through a Challenger or Columbia type of uh, uh, activity. Very important. Launch fever. Um, this, the, the human factor, and it's hard to describe what the environment is in the in the spacecraft, you know, a few minutes before launch or in the control room, but there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of energy. And everybody in there for the most part has been awake for the last 10 to 12 hours and they came to work that day or that night with all hopes of safely launching the space shuttle. And they really don't want anything to go wrong, you know, with their system or somebody else's system. I mean, that's that's the mood, you know, because because if something goes wrong, you know, you, you, you're going to come back tomorrow or next day or next week. So they really want to hear this. Everybody, you know, when they do the polls, say go, 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 go. That's I mean, and and the hardest thing is saying no when everything sounds like it's go. And there's there's a lot of times when the launch that we've had problems with ground support equipment. It's old. Uh, it. You know, I, I wish we had all new stuff for shuttle. A lot of the stuff is the same we used on Apollo. And in spite of our efforts to maintain it, it's all out in the corrosive, you know, atmosphere uh, at the launch pad. And that stuff constantly gives us gave us problems. Uh, and and we would lose some of our redundant systems and some of our primary systems. And and more than once in launch count, when we'd have a problem out there. Uh, the team would come to the launch director through that, you know, organization chart you saw and say, "Hey, we got an idea. You know, we think if we patch around this and then hook this up to this and we throw these switches and we get this result, uh, it'll be okay, and we can go fly without this power supply being active or this purge system operating normally and all these other things that we've got out there." And, and what you have to do as launch director is say, "Well." To sit back and 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 analyze whether or not I mean you, you rely on your engineers to to use their Yankee ingenuity to, to fix a problem but you have to assess whether or not they're they're literally you know shotgunning it and coming up with the proverbial quick fix because they want to go home in an hour or so and and you know and and celebrate a good launch and just like these guys want to get out of those uncomfortable suits they've been sitting in for the last couple hours and either get out of the spacecraft or get up there in zero G so as a launch director you have to assess well okay but is this really the right thing to do or are they working this too hard if you gave them another 24 hours to look at the data and think about their approach to a fix uh, would the answer be any different and and there's been a few times when they said well yeah that sounds pretty good right now but I'm going to give you another 24 hours to think about it. So we're going to scrub for the day, and you can hear the big groan in the control room, and and you can just see it going through their heads. You know, well, you know, this guy's lost confidence in us. You know, I mean, we all came to work. You know, we get paid to solve problems and get things done, and he's telling us that ain't a good answer, that ain't a good fix. So you you have to you have to balance that when you're in charge. But the real job of the launch director is to say no when everybody else wants to go. That's really what you're there for because everybody else, these guys, Jeff, they, they get tunnel vision, you know, they want to go fly. The console operators, you know, they things are on automatic, you know, in that last nine minutes and they just hope they don't get that little red or yellow light on their screen that says, hey, you better go look at this. It isn't, it isn't working right. That's certainly, I mean, the, the last people you want to ask, is it okay to launch is the crew. They'll say yes no matter what's happening. <laughs> and it's a form, we do ask them, by the way, but it's a formality because we know what the answer is. Unless he's got a fire extinguisher up there putting out a something in the guy, he's going to say, we're well, go. Um, that's, 
Uh, and that's also why we, we put in a rule that says after five minutes for these critical launch commit criteria items, the 500 that you absolutely have to look at and certify, you don't proposition us with the change to that after five minutes because we're not going to entertain it. If they're out of limits, we're not going today or tonight. It's going to be at least 24 hours. Uh, a long time but the, the team that, that does it I mean they're good they're professionals and they um, and we talk a lot about the Apollo program and, and how great things were back then but I mean I just gave you the example of Apollo 13 you know we we the shuttle team versus the Apollo team has a much higher degree of difficulty situation to deal with there's fewer people on shuttle yet it's a more complex vehicle than the Apollo, the whole Apollo system, the Saturn V rocket and the spacecraft were simple compared to the shuttle system. Uh, and you know, we had 25,000 people at the Cape in the Apollo program flying two to three times a year. Uh, and in the shuttle program back in the early 90s, you know, we flew seven times a year with 6,000 people. With a vehicle that's more complex, older, you know, in the Apollo program, our ground equipment was new and all the flight hardware was new. It wasn't reused. It was fresh, out-of-the-box, factory, pristine stuff. And the requirements were easy. You know, it either it had to act and look brand new or you replaced it. You know, the shuttle, because it's 20, 30 years old, depending on which orbiter and the ground equipment, which is 30 to 40 years old, uh, you know, there's there's requirements that allow fair wear and tear so that you have a lot the engineers are constantly pushed with the is this good enough you know these wire bundles are frayed and and there's dings in this line and that weld is looking like it's got corrosion on it is it good enough well they're constantly propositioned with that we're back in the Apollo program you didn't have to mess with that gray area stuff it either it looked or acted brand new or you replaced it and replacing it was easy because money was unlimited. As a journeyman engineer on Apollo, I was told, hey, whatever you need, you can have it. You know, system engineer seek more test equipment. Uh, you need more technicians to be trained on this over here. Whatever you need, just ask for it. Money's not an object. As a manager on the shuttle program, when I finally got promoted out of the job I liked as launch director, I had to tell the journeyman engineers, hey, this is all the money you get for next year. You got to, you got to be and be real efficient with this and frugal because next year you're probably going to get less. And, and your strategy and approach to issues is much different if you have those two different environments to deal with. And, and finally, the other thing you know that shuttle deals with today versus Apollo is the acceptance of risk. I mean, I already mentioned Apollo 13. Back then, if you made a mistake, you pat it on the back, say, "Hey, nice try." Now, is there anything you know can be done to better enhance your probability of success? Whereas in the shuttle program, you know, risk aversion in this country, you know, we get started on that tangent is becoming more and more our lifestyle. We don't want to do things that we might lose, you know, or we may not win, or we may not be successful. And and risk is you know, there's less tolerance to it. And when you have a problem like Columbia or Challenger, you know, you get half a dozen boarding parties coming into NASA saying, here's what you need to do different, or you, this is wrong with your agency, and this, and this, and, and you need to go fix that. And again, back in Apollo, that's a good place to go. Uh, it was, uh, what do you need to be successful? Much different, and, it's, and it makes it difficult to... Uh, to operate. Well, could you comment on risk aversion in, in, in the launch director and whether there are differences, whether there are more aggressive or more conservative people who've had your job? Well, and I, I would say before I was launch director, there was there was one other launch director, and and he was more aggressive than I was. You know, he would he was the consummate ops person, and he would push and he would push until you know you'd say, Uncle, I surrender, whatever, and then he'd make a judgment call. Um, I I was more conservative than that. My uh, 
my yeah, my success. They, I trained the one immediately after me, and he was pretty much the same. But, but he got you know the highly visible job management saw that you know hey, this guy is good. We'll you know we'll take him away from here and go put him over here managing you know this large organization and worrying about budgets and contracts. It's the same thing that happened to me, and that's and that's I mean that's unfortunate because, uh, but that's NASA's strongest suit is not success planning, unfortunately. It just isn't. Yes. So, so are, you, are you saying now uh, uh, the shuttle program is too risk averse? Because, because you also said that, you know, for example, it's your job as launch director to be conservative and just say no when everyone else is saying yes. I don't, I, no, I wouldn't say that the shuttle program is risk adverse. I'd say our society is risk adverse. And you see some of that permeating into the shuttle program. Um, but not to the point where I would say it's, you know, it's detrimental. I mean, asking questions, uh, you know, digging in to understand what your risks are is an important thing to do. And early in the shuttle program, we didn't do that. We had a lot of confidence in the hardware. After the first few missions, it's just like a new car. You know, you put 5,000 miles on it, you get the bugs out of it, and you fully expect it to last another so many hundred thousand miles. Well, that was the same expectation in the shuttle program. You fly a few flights and you learn that the tiles really stay glued to the orbiter and the thermal control system really responds as it should on orbit and managing the temperature and the coolant loops and that sort of thing. And you build up confidence and you say, you know, that this should, it, it should work now. We got the bugs out of it and we can go fly this thing as often as those guys at the Cape can turn it around. Uh, but what they didn't consider and what all these engineers with all due respect that you heard from that certified their systems, they didn't totally capture the environment that the shuttle sees over the long period of time in their initial certification. They didn't capture it. And that environment includes not only what happens in space or the calendar exposure to just time on some of these systems that have soft goods in them, for instance, O-rings and that sort of thing, but it's the environment of the Cape with people constantly removing hardware, disconnecting things, moving wire bundles out of the way to get access to this or that other component to implement the requirements that were levied on the Cape to do the tests and inspections. And they're very invasive and collateral damage is a is a way of life when you're crawling around in the orbiter so so to, to put in policy that tries to compensate for the fact that the certification didn't capture that environment that this hardware has seen for the last 20 to 30 years uh, and to reduce the unknowns involved in that is that's the right thing to do you know you're trying to, they're trying to reduce the risk of reflying a very complex vehicle. So, so that's fine, but you take that to a limit, I mean, you can talk yourself into never flying. It'd be pretty easy to go do. And then this recovery after the Columbia accident, uh, that, you know, that was starting to happen. You know, the, the managers, because they had this investigation board report that says, you know, NASA, you're, you know, you're, you became complacent and overconfident. And by the way, I, in my opinion, that's somewhat of a bum rap to, to say that NASA in general, and particularly the shuttle program, had fallen into that mode. But to have the pendulum swing the other way to say, understand what your risks are, and then you can have knowledge on whether you decide to accept it or not. Not. That's that's a good thing. But what didn't happen after Columbia, what but we did do after Challenger is after we understood the root cause of the accident and some of the other factors like communication that were were part of that reviewed all the systems, all the requirements. The manager said, look, we're willing to accept some risk. You people who are responsible for these systems and these processes at the Cape, you need to you need to quantify that for us and bring it to us. And we'll either say, okay, we don't accept that. You go back and change your system or change your limits or do more tests or whatever, or we will accept it. 
you know, we'll say we'll accept that risk management, we'll accept some risk. That happened after Challenger and we were able to fly again you know, to roughly two years later uh, after we recertified the design of the solid rocket motors. That didn't happen after Columbia. And, and you, I, I, you can speculate whether or not you know we could have flown six months ago or a year ago or we should have waited longer to fly because we still had a piece of foam come off the tank. Uh, you could debate that, but it, management never acknowledged that they were willing to accept some risk after Columbia. They did say, tell us what the risk is, uh, but we really want you to crank it down to zero. We don't want to take any, any risk, unlike, unlike Challenger. Um, now, is that, you know, is that bad? I don't, uh, see what really happened with Columbia was there were you know, the mission management team, you know, their discipline and eroded, and there was communication issues. I mean, if, you, if you're a student of that of that investigation, um, they didn't uh, they didn't they didn't grade out very well. But the the investigation said, you know, there's complacency and overconfidence in the system. Well, having been part of the system prior to my retirement five years ago, that you never found any complacency or overconfidence with the engineers, the technicians, or inspectors, or the managers that I knew. Now, they weren't as smart as they thought they were, or in some cases as smart as they needed to be, but that's not the same as complacency or overconfidence, because the latter to me implies an attitude problem, that I've got it knocked, I know it all, you know, I'm as smart as I need to be. And I never sensed, for the most part, you know, there's some people I didn't like because I thought he or she was arrogant or something like that, but I never sensed an attitude problem with the shuttle team and, you know, from the technicians, many of which I knew and grew up with, to the top managers in the shuttle program. I never, I never sensed that. But were we not as smart as we thought we were, or as smart as we needed to be? Were there, were there signs that, you know, there's something going on here that you ought to, you ought to go fix? Uh, yes. But again, you know, the, they, uh, they didn't just blow off, so to speak, uh, these problems we were having with foam on the tank and these other systems, which to me would have been, you know, that's complacency or overconfidence. Uh, Anything else? We're just, just about out of time. I've, I've got uh, two announcements. Um, I've been working with the Stellar people. Uh, as you know, some of the PDF files that I've tried to load didn't load. Um, they can't really figure out why, but I've sent them the files. They've loaded most of them on, so hopefully almost everything is there. We're continuing to work at it, uh, but hopefully all the things that you need access to, uh, you can find. Um, and uh, I said there were two things, but that's the only one I remember. Well, let me uh, close with one note then. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, thanks for your choice to uh, uh, pursue an engineering career, uh, doing things that are hard. I've found it in in my travels that uh, unfortunately there's fewer people deciding to uh, to pursue the tough curriculums and the occupations that require a lot of work and have some risk associated with them. Uh, but uh, uh, it's encouraging to see people in graduate school that, that want to do uh, what I did. I'm not sure how much engineering I did in my 40-year career. I, you know, I did a lot of managing and, uh, and a lot of other assignments, but um, I'm sure you can accomplish a lot. I, have a, I, I had a grandmother who, um, who was born at the end of the um, uh, 19th century, and, and when she was your age, there weren't um, any computers airplanes, cars, you know, TV and that sort of thing. Yet in her lifetime, she got to see her favorite grandson, Bobby, help put a man on the moon. You know, now I don't know what it can be done in your lifetime, but you, 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 know, you can make great things happen with the career you've chosen. So thanks for choosing it, really.
Bob, thanks very much. Pleasure.